Okay, well, we've got some preliminaries, so let's let's go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome everyone. We have a, a nice audience today, and as ever, it's it's such a thrill to see members of our whole community, students, staff, faculty, alumni, folks from both campuses, folks near and far. Welcome to all of you uh, to the Dean's Lecture and Concert Series at St. John's College in Santa Fe. And I'm Walter Sterling, the, the Dean of the College in Santa Fe. It's a pleasure to welcome you all and to uh, welcome our lecturer today. Uh, before I do that, I, I just want to acknowledge that um, we're about to go on our one week spring break. And I want to, as I've often done over the past year, commend uh, our whole college community, but uh, just today, I really want to commend the students on each step you're taking in getting through this, this challenging academic year, and I hope that you make the most of a week where I'm sure you've got reading and writing and other things to do, but uh, I hope there will be some rest and refreshment and a few fewer hours uh, on, uh, on screens this week. I, I urge you to make a point of that. Uh, and I also want to acknowledge that um, tomorrow will be, and, and we'll have more communication about this, but it, it will be the one year anniversary of the day that we sent our students off last year on spring break, not to come back. Um, uh, and I think a lot of us are engaged in a lot of reflection as we turn various one year anniversaries. And I guess the only thing I want to say about it today is it, it's, uh, uh, it's, it's wonderful to feel that we're at a place where every day is bringing uh, another step towards the reunion of our campus community and bringing more hope. Uh, and we're, we're taking steps daily in our phased reopening of the campus this semester. So it's a time of hope. It's a time of return. And um, I, hope, uh, I hope we all feel that powerfully, even as we're, we're meditating on other things about this, this last long, very long year. So uh, with that, I'll remind you that in terms of our format today, the lecture will be given in this webinar. And at the end of that, we'll close the webinar and then immediately open a Zoom meeting, which allows for uh, a very nice dynamic question period. So I'll, I'll put the link to the website uh, in the chat thread near the end, but it's there. And any way in which you receive the uh, lecture link, it should have had the question period link tagging along with it. Uh, it is my pleasure uh, and privilege to welcome today and welcome back uh, Dr. Daryl Haggard. Uh, Dr. Haggard is an associate professor of physics at McGill University in the McGill Space Institute and holds a Canada research chair in multi-messenger astrophysics. She and her team study the Galactic Center uh, electromagnetic counterparts to gravitational wave sources, accreting compact objects, and supermassive black holes and their host galaxies using multi-wavelength and time domain surveys. That is a mouthful. Uh, she is also a proud alumna of St. John's College Santa Fe, where she earned her BA in 1995. And uh, I won't say more about it, but she comes from a Johnny family with deep, deep roots uh, at the college. I will say this, that when, uh, when she got on our calendar, we thought she'd be here in person. And we're very grateful, Dr. Haggard, that you are willing to uh, join us this way. Uh, and I'll go on the record here, and it will be permanently recorded, that you have a rain check anytime you want to, uh, to come visit us once the world permits. We'd be thrilled to have you back uh, next year as soon as, as soon as the stars can align uh, uh, to have you share another, another talk. Uh, with this. Uh, so with that, I turn the, the floor over to you. Uh, Dr. Haggard's talk today is titled Observing Black Holes, Large and Small. Please join me in welcoming Daryl Haggard. Thank you so much. It's really a pleasure to be here um, and uh, to be here at least virtually with all of you. So I, I snuck a peek at the attendee window and I do have some wonderful family members here. So to my family, thank you for joining us tonight and to all of my fellow Johnnies out there, thank you for giving me part of your Friday night um, right before spring break. I know that is probably somewhat of a compromise. So thanks for being here with us and thank you for the lovely introduction, um, Walter. So um, I'm gonna share my slides and just dive right in. My hope, I'm a big talker, like probably many of you are. Uh, my hope is I can try to keep it short 
short um, so that we have lots of time for question and answer. So um, as uh, you know, I'm here to talk to you about black holes um, and it might sound like a little bit of a contradiction to talk about observing black holes. I mean, the whole point is that they're black, they're hard to see. So how do we go about doing that? Um, and I will just give you the full disclosure commentary here at the beginning that mostly we don't observe the black hole. We see the stuff around the black hole or the interactions between black holes. Um, and so that's mostly what I'll be talking about with all of you um, tonight. And I hope you'll jot down or commit to memory questions as I go along. I really do um, love chatting. Uh, so. Before I tell you about the black holes, I want to tell you about the black hole enthusiasts. So uh, people make all of this happen. The black holes are there in the universe. They're ready for us to come and look at them whenever. But it takes really the innovation and the hard work and commitment of all of these wonderful people that I have the great privilege of working with. This is my team. Um, these are two other faculty members here um, at, the, at McGill University and the University of Montreal, two of my wonderful colleagues whose teams also work together with mine. These are graduate students um, and undergrads um, and yet more undergrads who do research um, with my group, which we affectionately call MEGA, the McGill Extreme Gravity and Accretion Group. Um, that was, uh, Sud al Karuzi actually came up with that cute acronym. So um, it's really a pleasure to work with all of these people. A lot of you are working hard on your degrees and thinking about your futures. And um, just know that those of us who get the privilege of working with uh, junior researchers of all stripes, um, really, really appreciate your hard uh, work, your effort. Um, so I wanna take a minute since I don't get to come and see you in Santa Fe to give a territory acknowledgement for the place where I am here um, in Montreal, uh, my institution McGill. So McGill University is located on land which um, has long served as a site of meeting and exchange among Canadian indigenous people who also cross the border with the US and have many, many ties. Um, these include the Haudenosaunee, um, who are also known maybe more familiarly as the Iroquois or the Six Nations. This includes the Mohawk people um, and the Ashishinaabe, um, who are maybe sometimes more commonly known as the Algonquin nations. So we try um, though imperfectly to honor and respect the people whose lands um, and whose nations were the traditional stewards of the land um, and, and the water um, from the place where I am now. So I don't know whether St. John's has an, a formal land acknowledgement acknowledgement that they've um, put together with the local peoples there. But since I'm from Santa Fe, I spent a little bit of time um, as I put this talk together thinking about um, the territory on which St. John Santa Fe is located. And so um, Oganopoge, which I probably will mispronounce, um, is the original Tewa name for the area around Santa Fe. It means white shell water place. Um, and so my childhood home and the lands on which you all are located are in many cases unceded territorial lands of the Tewa and Tanos people. So if you haven't taken the time to get off campus and go out and visit the Pueblos around you, I really strongly encourage you to do that. It's a, a beautiful community of people, a rich language heritage and just rich heritage. Um, this might sound like a slightly weird way to start an astronomy talk, but I want to acknowledge right here at the beginning that many of our observatories, our telescopes are also located on indigenous lands. Um, and this has been a, a really a present issue for all of us um, and thinking about kind of our colonial heritage as scientists and thinking about what it means to do academic and, and contemporary science in the context of a lot of these um, sometimes complicated relationships with peoples and with lands and with other natural resources, including outer space as we have these wild telecommunication satellites which are making looking at the night sky more and more difficult. Um, so let me tell you just a little bit about me. I'm originally from New Mexico. Um, I have a fantastic degree from St. John's College Santa Fe where I graduated um, from the Santa Fe campus in 1995. I then moved on. I actually lived and worked in California and China and other places for a while and then returned and did a master's degree um, in physics at San Francisco State University, another amazing supportive community of people. I then did a, a second master's and a PhD in astronomy um, in Seattle, which is actually where I was born before my family returned to Santa Fe where I was raised. Um, 
I spent um, time as a professor, both at uh, McGill University, where I am now, and also um, at Amherst College, which unfortunately got um, covered up by the flag of New Mexico, the state of New Mexico, but at Amherst um, College, and I was a postdoc at Northwestern University. Um, I've done a ton of outreach um, and mentoring with people of all different um, career stages. As I mentioned, I've lived and worked in a lot of different environments. Um, I also spend quite a bit of time thinking about diversity, equity, and inclusion in STEM, science, technology, engineering, mathematics. Um, I've done this through a variety of different professional societies, the Canadian Astronomical Society, the American Astronomical Society, and um, through kind of committee work in my own home departments often. But I've also done quite a bit of self-study, a lot of reading, trying to understand institutional racism and other sorts of um, discrimination, but also ways to try to think about um, improving our environments and our communities for people, all backgrounds um, in the sciences. So, um, and then I, I write a lot of papers. I win a lot of grants. These are, this is my like academic profile. So there you have it. Um, this is Daryl in a nutshell, um, but that's not really why we're here today. So um, I share this with you partly because I know many people are thinking about their career directions and where their interests might take them. And so here's a long and winding road to getting from St. John's to my current um, studies of black holes. Um, and so, of course, I, I took my inspiration from St. John's, and I want to give you a little bit of the story about that. So these are books that all of you are familiar with. Um, and in particular for me, my fascination with astrophysics and astronomy came out of my junior math course, um, which I was taking with a professor, Jack Stedman, who's no longer with us, but was amazing and wonderful. Um, and I always, all my fellow Johnnies who were in classes we, with me will know, I really loved our um, math uh, segments. And so we were reading Newton's Principia and Jack Stedman explained to me that you could actually use the gravitational fields of planets in our solar system to slingshot spacecraft out further and further into the, so the solar system. These are called gravity assists. Um, and we were doing, you know, two and three body problems and thinking about how all that fit together with the math we've been studying. And this just totally blew my mind and got me really excited. And of course, this is how I attribute my interest in astrophysics. But the first time I submitted a, an NSF, a National Science Foundation grant, my mother also sent me my uh, middle school project that was about something to do with galaxies when they collide. So clearly it was an interest that, you know, kind of burgeoned along earlier than that. But this is a beautiful graphic which shows this um, thing that Jack Stedman introduced me to and helped me see um, all those years ago. So this is our Earth on this beautiful graphic. And all these colorful lines that you're seeing are the trajectories of spacecraft that are launched off of the Earth and sent out into the outer solar system. So just to show you how these gravity assists work, here's one particular mission um, that launched off of Earth, went whipping around Venus. At least one of the trajectories, looks like both of them came back around Earth. Sometimes they have multiple flybys, multiple gravity assists, and then get flung out to larger and larger um, distances in the solar system. So this is sort of the birth of a lot of my interest in astrophysics. And I hope you will take a sort of a little capture in your mind of what this looks like and, and look for some similarities and the things that I study now, and I'll try to point those out too. Um, okay, so this is this amazing black hole image that I think probably all of you have seen. This is an, a, just a phenomenal accomplishment um, by hundreds of scientists the world over. I feel very lucky to be a part of the collaboration um, that created this amazing image. Um, this is what we call a black hole shadow. So this is a supermassive black hole, a black hole with um, billions of times the mass of our sun. Um, and this is the light from the material that's around the black hole. And we're sort of seeing this in the black hole in sort of silhouette against this luminous material um, in outer space. And as I mentioned, a lot of the um, observatories that we use as professionals are actually located on sacred sites for indigenous peoples. Um, some of the uh, telescopes that link together to make this amazing image you're seeing um, belong to a network of observatories called the Event Horizon Telescope. Um, and some of them are located on the traditional lands um, in, of native Hawaiians on the top of Mauna Kea. Um, and so some of those people have worked closely together. Uh, some of the native Hawaiian folks have worked together with um, scientists to give this black hole, which is maybe kind of clinically called M87 because it belongs to the Messier catalog, but it also has a more um, exquisite name. It is also called Poehi, um, which is its 
native Hawaiian name. It, it, the, it sort of roughly translates to the generative darkness of creation. It's from the creation poem of the native Hawaiian people, um, which is called the Kumulipo. So this is maybe another way to think about this amazing black hole that we've managed to see using all of these incredible observatories. So let me tell you a little bit about this black hole. So I mentioned it has a whole lot of mass so that that dark silhouette that you're seeing has something like 6.5 billion times the mass of our sun. Um, that mass is packed into a very tiny volume and that's what makes it a black hole. So this is a wonderful XKCD comic, um, which is showing you this contrast. So here's the supermassive black hole. So it's the silhouette of the black hole against the luminous matter around it. Um, this little spacecraft out here, which is just, this is just an example. It's just to give you a size scale. There's actually no spacecraft in the middle of the black hole, just in case that was blowing your mind for a second. Um, this is just a little sort of diagram of our solar system, our sun in the middle, Pluto, our little dwarf planet out at very large radii away from our sun. And Voyager, the spacecraft that we've managed to get as far, it's the most distant human-made craft um, that we've ever managed to get. It's called Voyager 1, and it was actually shot out into the outer solar system using all those gravity assists. Um, and this sort of shows you that the scale of human exploration with craft, with spacecraft, is only ever managed to make it out to the very edges of this tiny, tiny, tiny little black hole um, it is in terms of sort of a spatial scale. All right, so the black hole's small is what I'm trying to tell you. So this thing that has 6.5 billion, that's a lot of zeros, not as much as the coronavirus relief package, but a lot of zeros, 6.5 billion times the mass of our sun packed into something that is about the size scale of our solar system. So that thing is dense, really, really, really dense. But it turns out you can make almost anything into a black hole if you can just make it dense enough. So this, um, is an example of an object that is much, much, much um, smaller than the mass of our sun. This would be our Earth. So it's about uh, three millionths of the mass of the sun. But if you could take this Earth, all of its beautiful oceans and mountains and people and trees, um, its core, its mantle, and squish it all down into something that's about the size scale of a sugar cube, it would become a black hole. So what does that mean exactly? I will tell you my favorite definition for black hole is to think about this concept of escape velocity. So an escape velocity is the, the speed that you need to gain in order to get out of the gravitational pull of a body. Um, and so, for example, if you're um, here on our earth back in its original form and you throw a baseball, if it's me, I throw the baseball, the baseball just flies up and falls back down. I'm not actually, I don't have a great throwing arm. Um, but if you could get that baseball going something like 11-ish, slightly more than 11 kilometers per second, you can actually get it to go into orbit. If you make it slightly larger than 11.2 kilometers per second, say 11.5 kilometers per second, you can actually get it to not just leave the earth but completely escape the gravity of the earth. So that's the escape velocity. But if you squish the earth down into this sugar cube size thing, that escape velocity just goes up and up and up and up as you make that mass compacted, more and more compacted as you force it into a smaller volume. And that escape velocity eventually will reach the speed of light. And as you all know, the speed of light is one of our fundamental constants. We don't think that stuff, information at least, can travel faster than the speed of light. So light is now trapped in orbit. It's trapped inside of the body. And that is how we think of black holes, or at least one of a few definitions. All right, so let's learn a little bit more about this amazing black hole that I showed you the image for. So we're gonna take a little zoom um, toward the constellation Virgo, for those of you that are night sky watchers. This video is phenomenal because every single thing you're seeing is actual astronomical data. This is real data, not an artist's impression or some cool movie somebody built in a computer, but real data. So we've zoomed now into a cluster of galaxies called the Virgo cluster. And buried inside of that cluster is this extraordinarily bright galaxy that has a very, very tiny object, this beautiful supermassive black hole down at its very heart and its very core. 
And I'm sure you noticed, but as we zoomed in, and maybe I can play the video one more time if it's behaved for me here. So here we are zooming off the surface of the earth into the sky after the blue lines go away. Now you're looking only at astronomical data. Um, and we zoom in toward the Virgo cluster, this cluster of galaxies. And as we go closer and closer to the central, very bright galaxy, you'll see there's this long jet structure that long jet structure travels, I mean, extends many, many, many thousands of light years away from this tiny little black hole and appears to actually be controlled by the black hole despite the black hole's extraordinarily tiny size. So this is known as a jet. This is a really exceptional feature that we think is controlled by magnetic fields um, that are tied down, kind of pinned to this luminous matter um, near the vicinity of the black hole. Okay, so now we're gonna do the computer simulation. <laughs> so this is now a sort of artist impression and computer simulation of what's happening much closer to the black hole. So here you're seeing that luminous mass that you might've noticed. And then we're gonna make a little mini simulation of the gravity around the black hole and how photons might be traveling near the black hole. So one thing that you'll notice is that the, the density of the black hole and the intensity of its gravitational field actually redirects and cause these photons to go into orbits. And as those orbits form into a sort of a structured uh, shape around the black hole, they tend to make this sort of interesting circular structure, which is this black hole silhouette um, that you're seeing in the observational data. So this is a, a sort of a artist depiction of what that black hole image would look like in, in a computer simulation. Um, and then once again, I just couldn't resist. I kept looking at the St. John's logo and I was like, but it looks so much, it would look so cool with the black hole. So anyway, um, there's the M87 supermassive black hole um, a la St. John's. Okay, but we wanna understand this image just a little bit more. Um, and so, one of the things that people have done have actually tried to trace out and really understand using general relativity and special relativity um, and our knowledge of radiation of photons um, and light and matter, sort of the classic E equals MC squared formulation, how do those photons actually move in the vicinity and the gravitational potential of the black hole? And it turns out that this beautiful sort of swirly image that I've showed you um, in a computer simulation is a little more crisp, but we can compare it to our observational data to learn quite a bit about the gravity near the black hole. And we think that these um, images <clears throat> are actually built up of several different sort of layers. And those different layers come from how many times the photon interacts with the black hole? Does it make just one single loop? Does it make sort of two loops around the black hole or sort of an interesting other um, shape as it interacts with the gravity of the black hole, which is probably also spinning as it sits there in space? Um, so if I'm lucky, this next video will actually play for all of you. Um, and so what you're going to see here is the black hole is here. Um, and this first little number n equals one is things just interacting one time with the black hole. So you can see each of these photons as it comes in sort of gets redirected, but only once as it interacts with the black hole. So the majority of cases is that single shot kind of interaction. Then you've got a two shot interaction. You'll notice these photons kind of get redirected twice as they interact with the black hole. Um, they make a slightly um, narrower ring as you're observing the black hole. And then one step further, these are now things having much more complicated multiple interactions with the black hole, photons that is. Um, and these then make an even crisper, very circular ring known as the photon ring. And it's when we superpose these different images of photons inter that interact once or twice or thrice with the black hole um, that build up together and are superposed to give us this really amazing simulation of what that black hole image should look like. And then we can compare that to the observations that we make um, to try to see whether or not our models are sufficiently sophisticated to um, really understand what's happening whether we can get at the underlying physics by comparing that model to the data that we see. Um, so this beautiful um, 
combined effort of both computer simulation and really exceptional observational techniques um, earned the Event Horizon Telescope collaboration the breakthrough of the year in 2019. Um, so that was very fun. And I, I, I've showed you these beautiful simulations, but I also want to take a second to just acknowledge the really incredibly sophisticated instrumentation that has gone into actually making this possible. So the Event Horizon Telescope is not a single telescope. It's actually a network of telescopes. Um, and they are spread across the entire globe. Um, there are observatories in Mexico, in California, as I mentioned, in Hawaii, um, down in the South Pole, and um, in Africa as well. All of these telescopes are actually, they have special instrumentation so that when they are all turned on and we have good weather everywhere in the world, which is hard, um, <clears throat> when they, they are turned on, they actually can clock the arrival of photons that they are able to observe so precisely that we can take the signal from all of these observatories, combine it together using a technique called um, very long baseline interferometry. So you all have all thought about interferometers almost certainly in some of your classes, um, but the very long baseline means that these are spread out almost as far apart as we can get them on our globe. And we, we synthesize this image by taking signals from all these different places on the globe and combining them together to make a single observation um, by using the arrival times of those photons as our sort of metric for understanding which photons are connected to which other photons um, in this sort of spatial dimension on the sky. So the Event Horizon Telescope is sort of this amazing hodgepodge of observatories all over the world um, and some incredible electronics and incredible um, synthesis of these different uh, wave fronts that are observed at each different space, each different place across um, the space of our globe. Of course, these kinds of efforts don't happen in isolation. Um, the Event Horizon Telescope con is, collaboration is comprised of more than 200 scientists, 60 institutes, 18 countries, and six continents. Um, and there's no question in my mind that seeing this kind of amazing synthesis of knowledge and of technology and of modeling and of um, scientific thinking and innovation um, was really, it fell on welcome ears in the, um, in the world at a moment when there was just feels like there was so much strife even before coronavirus. Um, and so people were really excited to see this incredible international collaboration come together to make this spectacular image of a black hole. Um, and this collaboration was also awarded the Breakthrough Prize um, for, for physics in 2020. Um, so I want to take a step out and remind you of that first image that we saw together um, when we were zooming in toward the Virgo constellation and looking all the way in toward the galaxy and toward the black hole. So now you're seeing that as a sort of a singular snapshot. And what we'd like to know is there's this phenomenal black hole that we think is fascinating and an incredible test of general relativity and special relativity. But how does it interact with all of the other elements of astrophysics around it. So that jet, that incredibly long jet that you saw as we zoomed in toward the galaxy is now very visible in this zoomed out image at the top here. This is that same galaxy, M87. The image, the Event Horizon Telescope image is buried down in here. You can see if you zoom sort of in as you go from top to bottom. And this jet extends, as I mentioned, about 3000 light years away from the black hole. The black hole itself is only 0.003 light years in scale across here. Actually, probably this little scale bar here. So maybe call it 0.006 light years across. Um, so the size scales between these two things are so vastly different that it's hard to understand how this little creature can create this enormous jet-like structure, which is extraordinarily energetic and has an impact on not only the galaxy in which the black hole resides, but the entire environment around that black hole. It is an extraordinarily fascinating and complex system. So you can see we have incredible images. So here's our black hole that we've looked at from the Event Horizon Telescope. As you zoom out a little bit, you can start to see this, the base of this jet-like structure. You can see the sort of two sides of it because if you imagine looking at a cone, um, you kind of have a little bit more stuff on this side and this side if you're looking at it, you know, from the front. Um, and, it's, and you can kind of see through it a little bit. Then you get a build up here and here. Look at a wine glass sometime and you might be able to see what I'm talking about. But we're basically seeing this kind of 
conical structure. And we see the two sides of it um, here down very, very close to the black hole. And then as we zoom out, we can start to maybe visualize that conical structure, that jet-like tube a little bit more. And then out here at large scales, we can see it spread out and start to interact with the whole interstellar medium. Just so that you know, we actually think this jet is two-sided. So there's one side going this way and one side going this way. Um, we, can, we have a hard time visualizing the jet going this way. It's too faint for us to see, but we can see it smashing into the interstellar intergalactic medium out here. Um, so we think this is actually a structure that extends in both directions. So this is all a part of the same galaxy. Um, our, my team and I also then go, so this is a radio image, I should have said that. Some parts of this image are actually collected right near you in New Mexico um, at the very large array. Uh, and so this is uh, emission that actually arises from, if this is a single, let's say this is two magnetic field lines, and I'm a little electron and I cycle around that magnetic field line, every time I round the bend, I'm being accelerated slightly and that causes me to lose a little bit of energy and emit a, pho a photon, a little bit of light. So that acceleration of electrons along magnetic field lines is a special kind of radiation that we call synchrotron radiation. And the wavelength of light that it emits is at radio wavelengths, so very long wavelengths, even longer than your cell phone uses, for example. Um, my team and I often study systems like this, but at the other end of the electromagnetic spectrum, at the very high energy end of the electromagnetic spectrum at X-ray wavelengths. So this is now the exact same galaxy once again. Here you're seeing that same spectacular jet, but now what you're tracing out is very hot gas. So this gas is millions to billions of degrees Kelvin, so extraordinarily hot, emitting at X-ray wavelengths. And you can see that we don't have the same kind of beautiful spatial resolution when we look in the X-ray, but we can trace out some interesting complementary structures. We don't see the jet extending out very far, but we see other very fascinating tendrils of hot gas that are also being heated by energetic outflows from the black hole and the surrounds around it. Um, so once again, just to remind you, this tiny little structure is buried way deep down inside there. Um, okay, so this is just now to try to draw that, that final connection back to my origins at St. John's and really getting excited about astrophysics because of these incredible gravity assists. Um, and I hope you can all see here, but now it's not just spacecraft that are getting these totally wild gravity assists. It's actually photons in the vicinity of a black hole that are getting these amazing gravity assists as they orbit around and are flung out of the vicinity of the black hole just outside its event horizon, um, building up to make this really beautiful, beautiful image that we've seen. Um, and then the work of a lot of us now is to try to take this incredible image that we've seen and link it up to structures on these much larger scales. So this is an artist's impression of those data I just showed you and try to understand how does this black hole um, you know, interact with this swirling hot matter near it and in fact create this enormous jet that can extend out over enormous um, long distances. So my fascination with orbits has not yet died um, and I'm still really, really deep into it and in thinking about how those orbits are, are informing um, our understanding of black holes. So um, here it is again, just to remind you that this is some of, some of where I came from and how I got from St. John's to the Event Horizon Telescope. Um, I want to take the last part of my talk just before I wrap up to talk about a totally different way of learning about black holes. It's still an observation. It is not the kind of observation that you think about normally. So the second type of black hole, so I said observing black holes large and small. So we're going from the large ones, the 6.5 billion solar mass black holes um, down to something much smaller. So this other kind of black holes are black holes that are now only maybe 10 or 100 times the mass of our sun instead of being millions to billions of times the mass of our sun. These are small black holes. We, we think we understand that these black holes are born from the explosions of massive stars. Um, you've all heard of those as supernovae. So we think that these black holes um, are really everywhere in galaxies. So those supermassive black holes that I spent a lot of time talking about, M87, for example, um, Poehi, is a singular, very massive creature that lives down deep in the depths of the galaxy's gravitational potential. 
These smaller black holes are spread all across it, kind of distributed the same way you might think of the star as being distributed across the galaxy. And these little black holes are really, really hard for us to detect using um, electromagnetic radiation, using light, radio wavelengths, or X-ray, or optical light. But um, there's a brand new experiment called LIGO, which is the Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory, which is actually able, when you have two of these black holes or a black hole and a neutron star close to one another in orbit, the two of them actually can act kind of like an egg beater in space, and they whip up the fabric of space-time. So this is yet another totally different way of testing the predictions of general relativity and trying to understand whether in the same way that we think of light as this wave, whether the fabric of space um, and time all around us actually can have a wave-like representation or structure as well. And this prediction of gravitational waves from two orbiting bodies that are orbiting closer and closer and closer together over time and thus losing energy to this radiation in the fabric of space-time. This was a prediction of Einstein's uh, almost a hundred years ago, just a little over a hundred years ago now. Um, and just very close to that hundred year anniversary of that prediction, these amazing interferometers, um, there's one located in Hanford, Washington and one in um, Livingston, um, Georgia? No, Livingston, Oh, well, my brain just stopped for a second, sorry. Um, anyway, two amazing observatories, one in the south and one in the um, north. Uh, West. And these two observatories managed to detect for the first time these incredible gravitational waves um, in, in the fabric of space-time. And so I want to talk to you just a little bit about the first time we saw a joint observation. So these gravitational waves have been detected now for um, quite a large number. I think about 60 little double black holes merging together. But when you merge together two small black holes, there's no light emitted. And so we don't get a chance to also look at it with all of our observatories, all of our telescopes. But if one of those two objects is not a black hole, if one of them is a neutron star, so a neutron star is a, another body in astrophysics that just never got quite mass enough, massive enough to be a black hole. So it still has sort of a rigid surface. It's still, it's extraordinarily dense, but it's not quite a black hole. So this neutron star, um, structure actually can do the same thing. If you've got two neutron stars together or a neutron star and a black hole together, they also can orbit and lose energy in their orbit and give off radiation in the form of gravitational radiation, gravitational waves. Um, and the neutron stars don't actually have this sort of point of no return for information. So they can also emit light as well as gravitational radiation. So we had this incredible opportunity in 2017 to ob observe a neutron star merger. Um, hopefully all of you have already figured out that it's in this box. Um, so what you're seeing here is a fade from of a galaxy. It's a picture of a galaxy. The first image that you see starting now is a Hubble Space Telescope image, and it fades from the optical light that we see with the Hubble Space Telescope to X-ray light, those very hot photons I was talking about before. Um, and in this box, you're seeing the location of these two neutron stars that lost energy in their orbit to gravitational radiation, slowly but surely spiraled in so close to one another that they actually eventually slammed into one another and created a neutron star merger. When they smashed into one another, they had an explosion that we call a kilonova, which is a little less bright than a supernova, but an equally explosive and exciting event. So here is a sort of a depiction of that kilonova going on. Um, again, this happened in 2017. You can see this is the explosion at the position of the two neutron stars. They also shot out some fabulously bright material in the form of one of these really, really amazing jets that slammed into the interstellar medium and lit the whole thing up um, for us to watch as observers. Um, so this is a totally different way to learn about black holes and neutron stars. You're really seeing their impact um, via gravity on the fact of space-time. And when we're lucky and we can link that gravitational wave emission up to electromagnetic emission, we can find a way of taking this very new way of exploring the universe and linking it back to this amazing historical 
pursuit of astrophysics um, and astronomy that all of you have seen in, in your classes beginning in your freshman year. So this is actually not the most complete and up-to-date plot, but this gives you sort of a feel. Um, these, these numbers along the side here are showing you the mass of the object. So it might be a neutron star. The neutron stars are all these little yellow um, folks down here. The, the blue ones up here are black holes, but they're the smaller kinds of black holes. Remember I said something like 10 to 100 or 200 times the mass of our sun. Um, and we think that these little objects can actually smash into one another um, and make new objects. And we're actually not quite sure when you smash together two neutron stars, whether the thing that you get out at the end is another neutron star or a black hole itself. Um, and so this has opened Pandora's box of all sorts of new questions. You can see funny little question marks in here. This is not your usual scientific plot, but we really are um, sort of breaking into a totally new domain here and starting to learn about um, these new types of objects. Um, and so this is this first merger that I told you about. This is two neutron stars that smashed into one another. We think that they made a black hole, but we're not 100% sure. But we sure had a really great time following up and watching those jets of emission and that explosion happening. It was really exciting. And I was on a paper with, I forget now, but I think it was something like 3,000 co-authors from all over the world reporting this very first we call it a multi-messenger um, discovery. In this case, the two messengers are electromagnetic radiation photons and gravitational waves. Um, there are other messengers. The two other cosmic messengers are neutrinos, um, which are pretty awesome and can also be detected by these amazing, you know, often um, huge observatories underground. Uh, so neutrinos are one of the other messengers and cosmic rays is the, is the, the fourth kind of cosmic messenger. Um, the other thing that we think we've seen that was a first time in um, just the last year or so um, is the merger of what we think might be a neutron star and a black hole. Um, in this case, as the neutron star and the black hole come together, the black hole has such strong gravity actually kind of shreds apart the neutron star and makes one of those um, sort of hot plasmas around the black hole as the neutron star falls in um, and disappears underneath the event horizon of the black hole. Um, so my team and I spent a bunch of time trying to find electromagnetic radiation from this source. Um, I won't bore, bore you too much with these more technical plots, but um, this was the position on the sky where we thought we might be able to see it. And all these little patches you can see, each one of these tiny little patches is a different telescope observation. And we kind of, we do this thing called mosaic just kind of taking little imprints across the sky, trying to find electromagnetic radiation from that neutron star black hole merger. We were unsuccessful in this case, but so was everyone else. So there was never electromagnetic radiation um, reported for this source, um, but we are hot on the trail and very excited to try to find um, more electromagnetic counterparts to gravitational wave sources, again, so we can create this kind of linkage between our more traditional astrophysics and astronomy and our, our kind of new capability to do gravitational wave astronomy. All right, so I started with people and I wanna just end with people. So my team is amazing and I love them, but then there's also these other incredible scientists and black holes have been just a part of the zeitgeist for the last you know, five, 10, maybe much longer years. Um, but the very first detection of two black holes merging together, um, here you can see a artist simulation and this is actually the first, um, the first data um, seeing these two different um, streams, one from Washington and one from the South, um, as, they, as they kind of trace out this merger and you can see how beautifully they match. It was such a great confirmation. Um, and so several of the creators of these amazing interferometers won the, the Nobel Physics Prize, the Nobel Prize in Physics um, back in uh, 2017. And then more recently, just in the last year, one of my wonderful mentors and friends, Andrea Goetz, along with Reinhard Gensel and Roger Penrose, um, won the Nobel Prize for detecting the supermassive black hole that lives right here at the heart of our Milky Way galaxy. Um, and you can see one of Andrea Getz and her team at UCLA's really beautiful videos here. This white star is here to really just to guide the eye. Um, and what you're seeing are stars in orbit around a supermassive black hole. So I said you can use light, but you can also use gravity to figure out what's going on and what the mass of a black hole is. So these orbits that you're seeing are beautiful, pure Keplerian orbits, like the ones you have all studied in your 
your, um, your math classes at St. John's. And as we watch multiple different stars on different Keplerian orbits with some dark mass that seems to be very, very large at one of the focuses, um, we can eventually back out, just do a simple calculation that probably all of you can do, um, the mass of this black hole. And people um, have done this work, these scientists in particular, Andrea Getz and Reinhard Gensel have done this work over more than 20 years now, tracing out the positions of stars near this black hole and found a very precise mass for the supermassive black hole that lives here in the Milky Way galaxy. It's around 4.3 times 10 to the six times the mass of our sun. So just a little bit more than 4 million times the mass of our sun. And Andrea Getz likes to joke that, that, that she can make that measurement to greater precision than most of you know your own mass. Um, so that's a pretty incredible accomplishment for a black hole, especially in the Milky Way galaxy, you have to look through the entire junk of the Milky Way to see in there. And so very, very exciting science. Um, I'll tell you as a member, both of Galactic Center research groups with some of these collaborators, but also the Event Horizon Telescope that our next image we're hoping to share with all of you, maybe this summer if everything comes together, um, is an image of this supermassive black hole at the heart of our own Milky Way galaxy. So that's it. I'm just gonna end here um, and say, you know, I can't really do the laugh, the sort of cartoon laugh, but um, this is this is my my last um, thank you. And I also want to just remind you that I've tried to interleave, you know, sort of our my feelings about um, science and equity in STEM and a little bit of a social justice message. So I won't just say black hole folks. I'll also say black lives really matter. Um, please go out there and work hard, both for the intellectual pursuits that you love and also to make this world just a better place. Um, and with that, I'll take questions.